So welcome everyone and, and firstly and probably most importantly, I hope everyone is safe, I hope everyone is well, I hope your families are as well. It's a bit of a weird time that we're just going to kind of just try and be normal here because the uh, best thing to do in these crazy times is to just be normal, right? So we welcome you to Podchat Live episode 68 um, and we are massively thankful for Talisha for getting up uh, early this morning. Is it like 6am, 7am there, something like that? It's quarter to seven now. Quarter yeah. to seven, yeah. So thank you so much. Really appreciate you, you joining us. Uh, we're big fans of yours. Nitta has told, you know, a previous guest of ours has told us all about you. And when we said we wanted to do another another episode on, on exercise, rehabilitation with, with the podiatry slant. Um, well, hang on. I've just, just we're, we're, hang on. I've just, sorry, I've oops. just got some feedback. All right. I just, that's okay. Sorry. Just stopped it. Carry on. <laughs> All right. Well, I mean, bad feedback about me. It does happen. No, no, um, no. no. Yeah, this when, was audio feedback. <laughs> when uh, when we said we were going to do an exercise, uh, ex- another exercise episode, your name came up. So yeah, we're massively grateful for you to join us. And um, ah, thank you. Uh, you know, we'll we've we've only done. I look back through our previous sixty seven episodes, and although we've touched on exercise and we've touched on 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 rehab in in multiple. The only one I think that we probably had, uh, you know, the title is dedicated to was, was, was Ben Cormack's one back in yeah. 40, 41, something like that. So it's overdue. Um, I feel when you've got 68 episodes now, having only two uh, sort of pointing towards rehab, strength conditioning feels a bit weird because it is something that, that we're seeing just so much more talk about, which, which we'll come on to. Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, anyone watching, um, like I said, uh, thanks for joining us as well. And if you've got any questions as we go along, and it is one of those kind of topics that you may have, just fire them into the comments. I, I'll be glancing down in this direction to try and keep an eye on them uh, as will Craig and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them as we can. So where should we start? We'll start at the beginning, which is... I think it's the same in Australia as it is in the UK. This this general um, sort of underlying I don't know, I, I don't want to use the word fear it feels like too strong a word but maybe lack of confidence in in one's own knowledge uh, if you're a podiatrist when it comes to prescribing exercise when it comes to deciding you're going to be the one that oversees the strength conditioning program um, you know I think historically it's very much been something that we think oh, let's, let's send that to the physio uh, it doesn't seem to be um, something that is massively taught or given lots of attention at undergrad um, so I mean I guess the first thing I'd like to ask is is that fairly similar in Australia is your experience of Australia UK are we on similar playing fields there and secondly why why do you think we have this fear or this lack of confidence and what do you think ultimately we we, we could or should do about it yeah I, I think it's very much the same in australia just from my experience and some of the podiatrists that i've spoken to and that's recent graduates and people that have been practicing for 15 20 years um yeah there's definitely a lack of confidence in the area of exercise prescription and I think it sort of comes twofold one like with a lot of our I'm not sure what it's like now but my undergraduate we didn't really get much exposure to any exercise therapies in our uni clinics Um, and even when we're on clinical placement I think there was only one clinic out of my entire four years that I went to that I saw anyone prescribe exercise and yeah, I think there's a lot of fear as far as um, oh, you know, lack of confidence, that is probably a better word, um, in the sense that people don't want to get it wrong. They think if I oh, prescribe this exercise and it has an adverse effect, um, yeah, everything's going to fall to pieces and it's going to be horrible. But it's once you sort of have an understanding a little bit of the basics and you start off pretty slow with something and just sort of see where you can push the limit with what they can do physically it is pretty easy to do uh, it's you'd have to be doing a lot wrong to create a huge adverse reaction with someone so you wouldn't be getting an 80 year old to deadlift on day one of a rehab but even just starting off with basic movements um, that builds their confidence in the movement but also yours in prescribing the movements i don't know if that answers a question or not yeah, uh, just to add a supplementary question to pick up on something you said there about people. I think you're absolutely right. People worry about worry about getting it wrong. Um, what what is you know 
we always say to people, they think the same when, when they're first prescribing orthoses. When we see new grads and they're writing orthoses prescriptions, the, the, the nervousness is, well, what if I get it wrong? And you sort of you know, calm them by saying, well, firstly, you, make, you learn by making mistakes. But secondly, like, you just, you know, if you get it wrong, well, it's, it's probably not going to kill anyone. And the person, yeah. you, know, you, you, you give the advice and the reassurance and the education at time of issue that, that hopefully the, even the, the, the recipient notices when things are going wrong and they act accordingly. Is, is that a reasonable parallel with strength? And if, if people do get it wrong, how, how wrong can it go? Yeah, it's, I agree 100% with that. It's, um, yeah, I think if you educate the patient as far as, okay, we're doing this movement to try and achieve this outcome, but it is normal when we're working with tissue that's injured that you may have a flaring pain or something like, yeah, not feel too fantastic when you're doing the movement. If that's the case, we go back to the drawing board and we can regress the exercise or modify it. So it doesn't necessarily mean that the intervention's wrong. It might just be the dosage that we need to tinker with, which is the type of exercise or the sets, the reps, how frequent you do it, everything like that. So it's same with orthoses. If you get it wrong, you just go back to the drawing board and you can start again. Like, I know in my early days, I reissued plenty of orthoses because I just ballsed up the script completely. So, and you do learn from it. And, and the word dosage there is key, I think. And I definitely, I'm just going to scribble that down um, because I want to, we, we're going to be talking about that later, I'm certain. Um, but yeah. while we're on the topic of people feeling uh, less than confident or dipping their toe in the waters and seeing how we go, let's, let's talk about something we definitely brought up when we last, uh, on episode 41 with Ben, which is the, the, the three sets of 10, um, for want of a better, I don't, I don't even know what to call that, but what, I think we referred to it before as the, the four degree various medial, medial various post of the strength and conditioning world, meaning it just seems to be this, this, this sort of template that it, people stick to. And it seems to be yeah. uh, the people that are less confident that stick to the template. Um, can you speak to whether there's as value in the three sets of 10 or whether it's, in your in your opinion never never relevant is it is it is it is it a case of horses for the courses and, and why do we think we were in this sort of scenario where people grab onto these formulas i think um yeah three lots of ten is just garbage in most cases <laughs> um and i think a lot of it is because so many of us don't have that um confidence in prescribing exercises um we want a formula so like i know so many people are like okay if someone's got this condition i need the exact exercise the exact number of sets and reps so the dosage to prescribe them so yeah they can just implement that and hope for the best but there was a paper that was released um i think just earlier this year that was sort of revisiting the strength continuum thing which is basically reviewing the sets and reps and exercise dosage and looking through that, there's so they did a review on all of the literature as far as exercise dosing um, for the sets and repetitions and sort of the, uh, what is it, the absolute loads and the amount of weight lifted for different things. A lot of it was knee exercises. But what they found was the amount of weight lifted didn't necessarily long term make a big impact on muscle hypertrophy and strength. Um, and then also the number of sets and repetitions that were done. What actually has the biggest impact is the physiological response. So for a lot of people, when they're reaching that um, RPE or the rate of perceived exertions, once they're pushing the limit to that, that's when they get adaptations. So someone can be lifting at 30% of their one rep max or 80% of their one rep max. But if they push to that level, they get the adaptation. So it's just when you're lifting a lower amount of weight, it might just take more repetitions to get there. But if you get there, you'll get the change. So with some people, um, yeah, their suitable um, range might be three sets of four repetitions. Someone else, it might be three sets of 25. But using the internal RPE, um, weight and monitor load and dosage, that's what they actually think. And from my experience, that's what actually does give you the results that you're after. Perfect. So, where should we go here? We're 
I guess the three of us would probably refer to ourselves as sports podiatrists. Certainly, uh, I think that's a, a title that, that I think we've all used. I've seen us all use on, on, on social media. And there's definitely this feeling that, that if you are a podiatrist that, that does rehab, does exercise rehab, does strength conditioning, it, you're probably, it's probably because you're working in a musculoskeletal team or you're aligned with you know, the MDT, you're working in sports. Um, but uh, I, I don't necessarily know that I agree with it in that I think about other populations and subspecialties that, that podiatrists take on, like paediatrics, uh, even the diabetic uh, foot or the, di the, you know, the population that we see with diabetes. Um, I just feel like having a good underlying knowledge of, of exercise, because exercise isn't always deadlifting, right? It could just be getting up and down from a, from a chair, depending on what population you're working with. Uh, yep. do, you think, do you think regardless of what we consider ourselves, specialty wise this is something that we should be better at oh 110 percent, definitely it's and like you said with the patient group so what we know um through the literature um it sort of lends to reason that general podiatrists or people dealing with older populations and diabetics i think it's equally as important for them to have some knowledge in the whole exercise therapy realm because of the problems that they can have so like we know with diabetes um and also age they're two things that do affect tendon structure and it, when it comes to arthritis exercise therapies as far as the inflammatory cytokines and everything like that it, exercise therapy does have yeah a lot of weight behind it being um, beneficial that's probably the best word for those age populations and ages and population, sorry, F yeah, for giving an outcome. So I think for an older person and an older person that may be a diabetic, um, their podiatrist really should have an understanding of some exercise-based therapies because that person will likely need exercise intervention, potentially even more so than a 24-year-old runner. Yeah. Exercise is medicine as the as the saying goes, or motion is lotion, yep. or whatever, whatever fancy term you want. Um, cool. So, um, actually, just sorry, before you move cool. on, just just Go. while you were talking, then this is what I quickly turned up in a matter of seconds: effective foot exercise on distal diabetic neuropathy, effectiveness of foot care with active range of motion and plantar exercises for reducing diabetic foot ulcer risk. Um, exercise improves gait reaction time, postural stability in older patients with type two diabetes. Um, diabetic foot ulcer, the role of exercise, um, and then, yeah, you know, like effective exercise on wound healing. So, like, just in the few minutes that you were talking, then I was able to pull up, you know, like half a dozen studies talking about the role of exercise and then the diabetic foot. So, yeah, you're right. It's not just sports, not just musculoskeletal. Yeah, definitely yeah. not. And see, people often think Craig just sits there and falls asleep or daydreams, but he's actually <laughs> grafting behind the scenes. Well, I, I, I um, set myself a challenge to see how many papers I could find before you stopped talking. And, you know, I've managed to find six of them here. <laughs> uh, yeah, there is boatloads of info there. It's just... Um, and that's, yeah, just in, uh, that's just in the diabetes. Then we've got the, the geriatric and the, the falls prevention stuff. Then yeah. we've got the, the pediatric stuff, uh, which I, I won't mention anymore because I don't understand it myself. But, you know, yeah, it, it seems to make sense. So we, we agree... That, that all podiatrists should have some 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 kind of base knowledge on this. We also agree that maybe it's not taught, uh, or maybe now, but certainly when we were all at university, it wasn't taught uh, particularly well. And we also agree that we might generally lack confidence yeah. from a perceived look, lack of knowledge. So how do we get that? How do, we, how do, we, before, how do we correct that? Before, before your answer, so sure, look, let me just respond to the, to the first, say, put my, put my old um, university lecturer hat on. To me, it was taught, um, but, and a very big but there, generally things like exercise therapy was probably one lecture and maybe one workshop. You know, manipulation was one lecture, one workshop. Strapping was one lecture, one workshop. Like there, there's only so much space in an undergraduate program. And then as a student, when you go on placement, it's, it's very dependent on where you may or may not do that placement as to whether that clinician uses that those interventions or not. So I, I, yeah, it's, it's one thing to argue, you know, we've got to teach more of this, um, but to do that, what do you leave out? And everyone's arguing for teaching more of their special interest. 
Um, so so I, I, I actually would defend the unis that, that, yes, it was taught, but it's in the context of, you know, how much priority do you give it next to manipulation, next to ultrasound therapy, next to strapping, next to, like, it's, you, you only have limited time in the, in, in the program to, to deal with it. But I'd be interested in your thoughts on that and how we could address that. Uh, well, get rid of the teachings about ultrasound therapy. Oh, no, that, that was a, that was, I apologise. That, that was a slip of the tongue. But that used to be taught. Hopefully it's not anymore. But it, it, my point was, for every therapeutic intervention, yeah. you literally have time for perhaps one lecture on it and maybe one workshop on it. And then it depends on your placements you might have as a, as a student clinician and your own special interest to go and pursue it somewhat further. And, and that's always been an issue. And, and it's... Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. <laughs> yeah, it's been a little while since I was at uni, so I can't really remember <laughs> too much about it. But, I, yeah, I think we spent, I think, shuffle, because I had the, the four-year undergraduate degree. I know that Newcastle Uni has three. But, um, yeah, there was, I think, a little bit of a rejig could potentially help. Um, I know that we spent, we had one subject that was on radiology and everything. Um, that was for one whole semester. And, yeah, the amount that we learnt in there was very minimal comparative to the time that we actually spent learning it. So I think possibly even integrating some form of musculoskeletal into other avenues. So even um, when we're doing subjects on diabetes, possibly integrating a little bit of the musculoskeletal impact on diabetes, so how that affects tendons, and then when we do our gerontology stuff also. So I think there's, instead of potentially having a massive rewrite of everything and a huge amount dedicated to exercise therapies, there is potential that it could be sort of inserted into a lot of existing subjects. Hmm. That's just my opinion, maybe. Me, but I don't I, work at uni, so I've got no idea. Definitely the angle I wanted to come at that from or ask that from wasn't and it wasn't digging out the unis was more it was more postgraduate actually it was more that that's just a fact and i don't have a problem with it um, but if we when we come out we need to take responsibility for getting strong you know we need to appreciate that the, the learning hasn't ended uni it now begins or continues so you know let's let's take the the new grad and we know where they are with regard to what they've been taught and what their level of knowledge slash confidence or perceived uh, fear, whatever it may be of, of, of knowledge. What do they do, Talisha? How do they get to where you've got to? I mean, what, I guess, you know, self-directed learning, but, you know, journals, courses, post-grad courses, shadowing, who should they shadow, you know, what, what, what sort of pathway would they, would they take post-grad? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, actually. Um, I know for myself, how my, so how I did things is very typical of me, which is the hard way. Um, so, and how I ended up getting into it, this is just a little bit of my life story, is I was working um, in a smallish coastal town, so there's about 30,000 people in the whole region. And um, what started me getting into the exercise side of things is I was treating musculoskeletal conditions, and then instead of um, just telling patients to stop doing everything, trying to help them train around an injury, so I'd sort of refer them back to their personal trainer and, and hope that they'd sort of write a program to train around the injury. And it wasn't happening. So I just basically got frustrated and went, I'll bugger it, I'll do it myself. So I did my cert for in fitness. And then part of that, a lot of the um, yeah, continuing education that you needed for registration, um, I chose a lot of the modules um, through Fitness Australia that were exercise rehab related. And then that kind of spurred into me looking into postgrad studies. So then I did a postgrad um, certificate in clinical rehab, which all of that was all well and good and quite expensive. But I think for a new grad podiatrist, like social media, it just gives you so much information and having some key people to follow, which a lot of those people you've already had on Pod Chat Live. So Ben Cormack, Adam Meekins, I think you've had Seth O'Neill, Matt Cotchett. That's how you pronounce his name. Um, yeah, there's, so I think even just starting going through the pod chat live ones, everything musculoskeletal, um, following those people, because they all have their own pages. Um, there's that, and there's also online courses that are around. So Ben has his um, online mentorship 
and then he and Adam have come together and they've got the Better Clinician Project, which I, from what I can gather, I did Ben's mentorship a few years back. Um, but I think their Better Clinician Project covers a lot of exercise therapies and the biopsychosocial and the pain stuff. And a bit of a self-plug, I am working um, with Ultimate Podiatrist and what I've done is basically throughout the years, because I've mentored quite a few podiatrist, whether or not they're new grads or been practicing for a while on exercise therapies. And what I did was, well, I got, I'd keep saying the same thing to the same people. So turned that into a workshop, but thanks to coronavirus, we've had to cancel the entire year's worth of workshops. So now I'm turning that into an online course. So busting my backside completely to try and get that up and running by May. Yeah, we, we totally allow plugs on here. Don't worry. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not against those. You're not going to edit that one out. <laughs> no, no, this is live. There's no, no editing. Um, what, there's a few questions coming. I'll have a glance at them in a second, but while you mentioned social media, I just wanted to ask something about social media. Cause like you say, not only is it a great place to follow key people and just, you know, whatever your, whatever your interest, you can sort of keep, keep your finger on the pulse, so to speak, but it, it does you do find that it, you get this sort of social media noise for want of a better word and depending on who you're following depends on what sort of noise you're hearing and you know historically talking more in the physio world really i guess it was very much the talk of, of, of the passive therapies and now we've moved much more onto sort of passive versus active so exercise versus you know, hands-on treatment or ultrasound or whatever it may be and you go on social media and it seems like everyone's shouting about strength about exercise about rehab and and you know that in some way way shape or form that the general message is just get strong just get strong and everything will be okay and i guess i want to ask you two things firstly do you do you agree with that is that, is that a good motto if anyone comes in the clinic uh, should we just get them strong and everything else will be okay is it is it that simple um secondly if it is uh, how are we measuring this? How, how do we decide whether they're weak for their given task? How do we know, how do we, how do we quantify strength gains? How do we know when they're strong enough? Yeah. Um, yeah, I th think globally, not just from an injury perspective, but anyone who's stronger is yeah, less likely to get injured. But then I don't think you can really apply that theory to the individual patient because it all depends on the pathology they've got the goals that they have so if you've got someone that they just want to improve their running a little bit and there's not a huge injury and they're not sort of weak uh, yeah like of a better word so there's no atrophy there's no muscle injury calf tear or anything like that there's no real point in just slap happy throwing some strengthening exercises at them because it's not really aligned with what their treatment goals are. So I think it's, um, yeah, the theory about improving strength is good, but I think, um, so Jill Cook talks about it a little bit. It's, I think, um, working on capacity is probably a better way to phrase it because capacity can be anything it can be endurance at full running or it can be capacity to squat 80 kilos things like that so instead of just throwing yeah the strength at someone um improving someone's capacity to do a certain task is yeah i think that's probably a better way to approach yeah. it and it comes back to that clinical reasoning doesn't it and to lean on the foot orthoses analogy we used earlier we we hate we now hate the idea of of of, of uh, any clinician seeing a uh, seeing a, a a patient an athlete, and sort of going oh I'm not too sure exactly what's going you know not really not really thinking their way through it and just sort of going well you know what I'll pop an orthosis in there I'll review them in three four weeks and and I'll cross my fingers that that something's changed. Um, do we think that? that people getting stuck down, getting going down the, the sort of strength conditioning exercise we have are at risk of doing that sort of knowing a bit about the subject, not probably knowing it as well as they should and getting someone in and going, Oh, I'm not too sure. Well, let's, let's give them some salial strength because I've read that that's kind of important and I'll review them in a few weeks. Like, you know, do we think just, uh, let me rephrase this. I'm waffling. Do you think that if someone um, doesn't, apply good clinical reasoning but just gives a runner say for example in this example the runner some salial strength work um is that is that good practice because they might come back and they might say actually i feel 
I feel a bit stronger or, or actually it's been three weeks so their pain has regressed to the mean, whatever it may be. I think I know the answer, but are you happy with podiatrists getting stuck into this, but they're not really understanding it and reasoning their way through it and just giving, giving strength work for strength work's sake? Yeah, I think like any treatment, I think there has to be the clinical reasoning for it, which, and it's the same with orthoses. Yes, I'm very, very anti someone that goes, okay, you've got foot pain, therefore you need orthoses. And that's as critical as they have been about their thought process. And it's exactly the same with people that dry needling. It's, oh, you've got calf pain. I don't know what to do. So we'll just do eight sessions of dry needling and hope for the best. It's, yeah, it goes with all of it. I think you have to look at the patient individually and go through their history and that'll kind of give you a little bit of an indication of what needs to happen and also testing them. So can they do, so they've got the, I can't remember the paper, but even just the normative values for how many single leg calf raises someone can do relative to their age group. So if you're testing a few things, um, in the clinic just to see what their capacity is and you couple that in with their clinical history and their treatment goals you can come up with a little bit of a better plan as far as prescribing an exercise so i do think there are some cases like you mentioned i don't know what i'm doing but i'll just give some celial strengthening so there are um, instances where that may work but it's the same as how Sometimes if that's as thought provoking as you've been with prescribing orthoses, yes, someone might go, oh, it's improved my pain. And you go, oh, that's good because I have no idea what I'm doing. And same with dry needling. So I think there is um, the potential that just throwing something like an exercise at a person can or may help. But yeah, I do think we need to be a little bit more critical of how we're doing. It. Yeah. So, Craig, are you going to say something? You, you gave one of your yeah, no, breaths. No, that make no I, I, I have got something I did want to raise, but I'm not sure now is the right time, but maybe I'll do it anyway. Look, I just, <laughs> um, look the, the, when I look at the evidence on strength conditioning in running, runners, yeah, I, 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 I don't doubt what the evidence says that it's helpful. What I have a problem with is what I call the Kool-Aid drinkers and the people that sort of take that and swear by it and, and you know for argument's sake if, if a, a runner does strength training and, get, and the research says he gets less injuries it could simply be that he's actually running one less day a week to do the strength training yep. so so the strength training actually had nothing to do with it now, i'm not saying that's the case but the, or, or it could be that the str a stronger runner does get less injuries or it could be that participating in a strength program increased tissue capacity so to me, there are three potential explanations there. Yep. It's just that people grab the one that suits their agenda and runs with. And often when I see strength and conditioning and runners, I, you know, my, my Kool-Aid drink sort of goggles go up and, 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 you know, and then you get into it. And I, 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 I do get quite exasperated when I see people talking and for argument's sake, I, I think I made another enemy last week by, you know, they, they were talking, they said something like, oh, there is increasing evidence that supports this. And I responded by saying, well, actually, there's not a shred of evidence that actually says that. Um, but I, I just get exasperated at these people. Where are, they, where are they seeing this evidence that doesn't actually exist? Um, and again, I, I, I just, you know, I'm not trying to sort of paint all strength and conditioning with the same brush, but I, I, I just, I, I do get quite exasperated at times when I see what, the way it gets promoted. So whether, whether yeah. you have any comments on that, you know, it's... Oh, we all love a little bit of bias, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, I do agree. And it can just be, it may not be necessarily that they yeah, are doing a strength and conditioning program. It can be that they're running one less day a week. So it's yeah, load management essentially. But yeah. um and a lot of the stuff that they've done, so how if someone's a marathon runner, for instance, um, can doing three sets of 10 squats one day a week actually reduce their injury rate? Like, we, I don't think we actually know for sure. It just, yeah, there's so many other factors that may feed into it. So even if it's just different I mean, um, input from a different movement and one less day a week. No, but I, I, would, I would go along with saying that you know the evidence may be starting to suggest that what the evidence is not supporting is the mechanism or the reason for it and it's people who like grab the reason and run with that 
And often the example yeah. I use is say you've got, um, you've got a posterior tibial tendon here that's got some degeneration and damage in it, and you've got a muscle here attached to it. How does making that stronger help that degeneration? Um, so having a super strong posterior tibial muscle, I don't see how that w w could help the damage. Now I could see how participating in a strengthening program would help the tissue capacity and the loading that may help that tendon problem. It's that's the issue I have. Is not necessary. It's that, uh, like I said, the Kool Aid. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, we don't know for sure, and it's mm. something that we may never know. But yeah, like there's and there's so many mechanisms that you can potentially oh. spin it helping. Mm. So like with the tib post, when we're in that sort of early stance phase, yeah. the muscles contracting isometrically, and then we've got yeah. that loading and yeah. energy absorption within the tendon. So whether or not it's just improving strength at the muscular tendon junction, or it is, the, like, we don't know. Yeah. Oh, no, I, I, I certainly do use loading and you do use strengthening. I, I, you don't get me wrong there. I just, you just, I don't know, it's just probably the, maybe the way people talk about it in social media that gets me wound up. <laughs> you're, following yeah, the wrong, you're following the wrong people, Craig. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, 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 they tend to block me. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, <laughs> Let's let's make this more um, sort of everyday and more more pragmatic. So we've talked about uh, you know podiatrists taking ownership of improving their own knowledge in the field of, of rehab, exercise, strength, conditioning, and we've talked about that if you're going to do that, then then please do clinically reason your way through it. Don't just don't just dish things out with some kind of algorithm. Um, Let's talk about the kind of the, the delivery of that. So what that looks like in the real world, if that's okay. So um, inevitably it was going to come up because it's my own little favorite area at the moment. But let's talk about um, things like behavior change and, and the bio psycho social model and how that fits into this, uh, which I know that, you know, you and I have spoken about this offline, um, Talisha, and I know you're a big, big uh, sort of proponent of this as well. And I know we talked about it with Ben, but, you know, it's all well and good saying, okay, let's, let's, let's assume we see someone, we decide rightly or wrongly, they are weak. We decide rightly or wrongly, they need to be stronger to get a good outcome. And we then write a program that is beautifully dosed and graded to, to mechanically make them stronger. We know that we've now got a human that we need to get to do this. They need to, we don't just tell people you need to do this because you, you'll get stronger and you'll get better they don't just go and do what we, they're told. We know that it's, it's more complex than that. I don't know what you guys have seen because we're on lockdown. At the, are you guys on lockdown yet? I don't think you are, are Not you? Not quite. Not officially. We're heading that way. Yeah, so, so we're semi on self lockdown. Yeah. So we're on lockdown now, which essentially means don't leave your house unless you are an essential worker going to work or unless you are doing something essential like buying food for your family or you're allowed out of the house once a day to exercise. And, it's amazing seeing how many people are now exercising because there's been a limit put on it. People that probably don't exercise once a day, but when I go on my, my normal running routes, it's not just runners, running, walking, cycling, like everyone is making use of this. It's, it's like the best behavior change I've ever seen across a, a population. Whereas we see people in our clinics and we tell them we need to do these exercises and, and that behavior change doesn't always take place. So could you speak yeah. a, bit, a bit to some of the techniques you use, whether they be coaching cues or whether it be the advice, the education, the reassurance, how do you get people on board with this exercise program that you've given them, particularly if they're not an exerciser, if you, if you know what I mean by that? Yeah, uh, I think with anything, it comes down to communication and education. So I think, if you're someone that it's just you're very fancy and you've come up with a diagnosis and you just hand someone an exercise sheet at the end of the consult and go here do this the likelihood that they'll actually be compliant with that program is actually quite low so i think um right from the start of the consultation is and ben talks about it quite a lot where it's making things meaningful so if you find out what the patient's fears are or their potential barriers to movement. So if they're not going for their walks anymore because they have heel pain and they're worried that it's going to make the, whatever the problem is worse. So finding out, yeah, what their fears are, what their actual goals are. So patients don't come in going, oh, I want to get my pain from a 10 out of 10 to a 2 out of 10. It's more so, 
I want to be able to walk my dog. I want to walk with the grandkids. I want to do this. So finding out what's, yeah, their goals are and what's meaningful to them. And then actually educating them about what the problem is. Like, and sometimes you don't need a diagnosis. Like some people, the diagnosis is you've literally just overdone it. It's educating them about what's going on and say if someone does have, um, say, Achilles tendinopathy, um, educating them about, and in simple terms, you don't overload them and make things too complex, um, about sort of what the tendon actually does, what's happening within it. So it's alterations in the fibres and by doing exercises. We don't know in adults if um, doing, say, eccentric training physically changes the tendon, but we know it can make it mechanically stronger. Um, yeah, so then if you tie in, okay, you're doing this exercise because you have this problem and the reason you're doing this exercise for this problem is it will potentially allow you to walk your kids to or grandkids or go for a walk with the dog. So I think, yeah, making it meaningful, finding out what it actually means to the patient, um, what their problem is. And, yeah, I've... Does that answer the question? Yeah. I ramble yeah. a little bit. No, no, absolutely. I'm the worst rambler going, so you're, you're doing great. Um, how, many, <laughs> how many exercises would you give someone per session? It very much depends on the patient. So there's some people that, um, because I don't just sort of write everything down and go, here, do this. It's I'll talk to them about what their sort of normal activity habits are and, okay, so as far as exercise therapies, like if I gave you two exercises or 10 exercises, you know, what would you be more likely to do? And there's some people that are like, no, I want to do a lot. And it's not just this problem I want to fix because I can't do this bit of, um, like say walking. Um, can you come up with some other exercises for me so I can, yeah, maintain fitness. So those people, like there are some people that they want a boatload and they might want to do an hour worth of exercise that day because they can't do other things. And then there's other people that go, look, it's, you're pushing shit uphill basically to try and get me to do anything. Um, so with those people, it might be just choosing the most bang for buck. So they might only get one, maybe two exercises. So it's all a little bit of a negotiation and a collaboration as far as finding out what they're willing to do and yeah. So I don't think there's one sort of solid answer for that. No, it makes actually, sense. Tasha, yep. you've, you've actually just reminded me of um, my, my first ever sports medicine conference way back in 1980 something and just how much things have changed. And I, can, I can recall, I can't even remember who the, who the speaker was or what profession they were from, but they said, if you give someone 10 exercises, they'll forget eight and do the other two wrong. And, and that was like 1980 something, but we've come a long way since then. So I, I do like that approach that you're talking about. <laughs> yeah. And I guess like anything, it, your, your treatment is always tailored and individualized based on the person in front of you, what their past exercise history looks like, what their future goals are like, and then them as a personality. And like you say, um, that makes complete sense. Off the back of that, what uh, question that's just come in to, to my phone here from a friend, what, uh, again, it might be a great question, but what, what pathologies do you find you are prescribing exercise for more regularly than others? If, 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 that, if there, that is such a thing that happens in your world. Yeah, it would be definitely um, Achilles tendinopathies, um, tip posts, dysfunction or the tendinopathies with that. Um, I do a fair bit of um, calf work. So people that have had calf strains and kind of getting them back to running and a little bit of gluteal tendinopathy. So it's mostly the tendinopathies and the plantar heel pain. Um, and then a lot of the other side of it is um, more just the running related injuries which michael sees more of than i do but yeah so big running injuries plus the tendinopathies um and do you mind if i just delve a bit deeper into two of the ones you mentioned there which are probably the two popular ones that people see most which is the plantar heel pain and the and the tib post i just want to make sure that people uh watching get the most sort of um get information that really is, is, is applicable and meaningful to them. So what, what might, again, I know we individual, but what might, a, might a, a tip post exercise look like that you give someone for a tendinopathy, for example? Um, depending on what stage they're in and sort of how aggravated it is, there, I 
usually you'll start off. So everyone loves prescribing car phrases for tip post tendinopathy, but depending on where they're at as far as the level of aggravation, that will come into it, but potentially later on down the track. So there's some um, single leg gait retraining things that I do. There's, I do a little bit of um, intrinsic foot strengthening. So the literature for that is still pretty limited, but Luke Kelly, actually you guys have had Luke Kelly on. Yeah. So um, yeah, so a fair bit of his work. So there is a little bit of, mounting evidence that yeah the intrinsics do do something i remember when i was at uni and there are a few comments from some lecturers that there's no point doing anything with the intrinsics because they don't do anything so i'm glad that that's changing um so there'd be intrinsic foot strengthening and that isn't necessarily as like for the reasoning of strengthening your feet will strengthen the arches and take the load off the tip post it's just a yeah, it can't hurt strengthening them and you can do that in 30 seconds. So for some people, they're happy to do that. Um, and then there's some isolated stuff. So there are certain exercises you can do that will load the tip post more. So foot positioning with a calf raise. So you can do the normal calf raise, abducted or adducted. And that loads the tip post and perineals a little bit differently. So that's one way that you can isolate the strength. And there's the calf raises. Um, there's one that I call the functional tip post where it's essentially you've got, uh, trying to find something. I don't have a foot model, but you might say this is the first metatarsal. So you have the medial border of the foot and you'll drop down to allow maximum sort of eversion. And then you sort of cue them to try and raise it up. And a lot of people, so flexor hallucis longus comes into it as well, but still isolates things better than doing say a calf raise um there's a truckload i think if i had some videos or pictures it might make it a bit easier to describe yeah. sorry i should have given you the heads up on that one coming in um and on <laughs> on plantar heel pain a uh, quick question that i always like to ask people the ratliff loading protocol a uh, big fan not not such a fan getting good results with it or or not it's I am a fan of it. I do like that they revisited that study and it kind of um, ties back to what we were talking earlier about the self-dosing. So with the first paper that was published in, I think, 2014, 2015, they had, uh, it was a sort of more stringent protocol of what they follow. But then a few years later, they revisited that and one group had the normal protocol that was originally prescribed and then the next group that was self-dosing and there was really no difference between self-dosing and the prescribed dosing as far as sets and reps. Um, I am a fan of it. We don't know for certain if it does anything sort of changing the collagen structure within the plantar fascia, but I'd say there'd be about 70% of plantar heel pains that come in if they do have the plantar fasciopathy. I will prescribe it with. Um, there are some people that they might have the plantar heel pain and depending on their presentation, their compliance with exercise and their treatment goals, I may not introduce that, but I am a fan of it. I don't think it's the silver bullet for plantar heel pain though. I think it's too multifactorial to just rely on one exercise to fix everyone. Yep. And yep. <laughs> last, oh yeah, <laughs> last Last question before we move on, just while we're on this topic, the, 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 the athlete slash patient that comes in to see you that, that is incredibly fearful of movements, uh, incredibly uh, you know, kinesophobic and they're catastrophizing and um, they're hypervigilant and all those other lovely words that we, we, we associate with uh, the now more psychosocial you know, phenomena of, of the patient in pain. Any tips for how you get these people, uh, how you get these people moving? It's education is a massive part and do not tell them that it's all in their head. It's, um, yeah. And I think practitioners, we need to improve our understanding of that a little bit because I very much know that I did it when I, it was sort of earlier days. Um, so 10 years ago, starting with the musculoskeletal 
where you'd come across a patient that was really kinesophobic and they have that fear avoidance and even if you go to touch their foot they're jumping and they're really I don't know, internally I found it very frustrating to work with but the more I sort of got an understanding of what's actually happening as far as the kinesiophobia and everything like that um it if we remain a little bit calmer and not panic about the pain as well it also helps them but yeah very much educating them about what's going on and how there can be sort of some sensitization with the nervous system and so education and then it may be starting them off on very very low load exercises so even just finding a movement that they can do that doesn't trigger pain or fear in them and you just get them doing that repetitively and then if that's calmed down and they go oh yeah i can do that and it's not hurting as much or that's one movement that does doesn't cause pain then we can sort of introduce something else that's slightly more loaded uh, it's just a slower process but education for both yourself and the patient is key in that and identifying what their safe zone of movement is perfect and runners we know that they like running obviously they don't like they don't like to not run um I'm, and on that note i i applaud you for working alongside knitter while he was not running he must have been just an absolute nightmare to be around i'm guessing you know when he had his uh, when he was just cycling all the time you know runners when they're not running they're miserable aren't they they, they just want to run um when he handled it better than I thought he would. Did he? Did he do okay? Yeah. <laughs> when, yeah. when do you tell a runner they can't run? Because, you know, we definitely like the idea of just keeping runners running, and, you know, unless, unless they're running on, on, on a stress fracture or something. But, you know, can running be rehab, I guess, is, is, is one way to word this question. And when a scenario is when you would say to a runner, look, I'm really sorry, my, my goal is never to tell a runner they can't run, but you right now probably can't be running. Yeah. No, Nitta and I are both the same in that it's with, um, yeah, so many runners and even just patients in general, it's, we try to keep them as active as possible while sort of just tapering them down to a point where whatever injury it is can heal. So it, mentioning stress fractures. So there are some, they've got the two types of stress fractures. So you've got your higher risk stress fractures and then the lower risk ones. Um, with the lower risk stress fractures, um, usually even if it's just sort of two weeks of reduced load to allow some, allow some osteoblastic activity to really kick in, um, you can start them running just with a reduced load to, yeah, so, well, even if it's not running, they might be able to walk and do gentle running a few weeks later down the track. But it's, yeah, for the most part, you can keep people active with an injury and not telling them to stop because if you tell someone to stop completely, it does bring in other problems because you can just have some global deconditioning that happens, which that in itself, if they were very much boom bust, a lot of us, I know I am. Um, if I have sort of six weeks off running because I was in a fracture boot, I know as soon as that boot comes off, I'm going to try and run that 16 Ks I did just before. It. So yeah, you don't have to stop people from, <laughs> doing their running unless it's that higher risk. So the higher risk fractures are the navicular, the talus, I think the fifth metatarsal, and then the lower risk ones are sort of the uh, posterior medial tibia and other ones like that. So giving them two weeks reprieve just to allow some bony remodeling to start and then very low load running, getting them back into it. Yeah, that gradual exposure from there. Yeah. Perf perfect. How are we doing for time, Greg? Oh, we've got, 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 got a little bit of time because we started a bit late. So just. Nita has, Nita has just joined us, actually. So hello. Hello, oh. Michael. Hello, sir. Nice. We were just talking about. Bit of late, in, bit, of late than, bit of late than never. We've just been talking about you, Michael. Almost like his ears were burning. But um, yeah. so we're look, okay I've, for time. So yeah, go on, Greg. I've got one thing to share here. Look, I've just. This, this is a study that I, I refer to quite regularly. It's from 2013. And. I don't know, I've referenced it so many times, and this is this is what sort of scared me a little, that uh, isometric knee extension strength in runners over the age of 50 declines about 5% per year. That's a hell of a lot. Like, like it's a... Um, so so, so my, my question, my issue is that you, you've got, so say for the age of, over the age of 50, you know, muscle strength declining. First question is, is that an indication that all runners over the age of 50 should be in a strengthening program? But 
the second question, probably more important one, is if, if muscle strength is declining from that age onwards, can strengthening um, make, must make the muscles any stronger? Or can it just stop that decline happening? Which, to me, potentially well, makes I'm the rehab... I'm not a of, physiologist, but I can... Yeah. But you see, you see <laughs> the point I'm making, you know, that it's... Because um, yeah. it's obviously an issue I'm dealing with with my own running, with my own knee, you know, that I... I, I sort of gave up gym work for a year or two to concentrate on running and then it ended up with a horrific injury that only started to get better when I'd started doing my strengthening. You know, it's just sort of, but I think you see and the issues got, I'm getting And you've at. got a birthday and you've got a birthday coming up in about four days. Oh, time. I know. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Another, so another, another five, percent. another 5% gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, no, well, the body, like up until the day we die, the body has the ability to adapt. So, yeah, I think strengthening, well, I think movement is important right up until then. So it's, if you're sedentary, of course, things aren't going to go too fantastically for you. And the cross linkage changes with diabetes and aging, all of that will kick in potentially faster. So I think strengthening, yeah, anyone over the age of 50 should probably do some, but do they need to squat like crazy, deadlift like crazy? Maybe not. Do they need to move a lot? Yes, we are built to move. Um, and whether or not it's, I think, worst case scenario, doing some form of strengthening or movement at all, that will at least slow the process down. So you might turn your 5% into 2%. Yeah. So get in the gym, Craig. Get in the gym. Get on oh, the way. The stuff. gym's closed. <laughs> Can't yes, even get in the pool good. to rehab well, my you, knee. So <laughs> you need to take regular, regular movement snacks. Um, let's talk a bit. About, <laughs> I know we, we've re referred to the state of the world a couple of times, and you know, no one is is uh, silly enough not to think that you know we look out the we're not allowed out of the house. The gyms are all closed. Um, I'm personally, my clinics are all closed. I'm not seeing any patients. Not you know, we're all getting nervous. None of the, you know, not, none of us who are self-employed are making any money. And oh, yeah. uh, there's a massive push uh, at present in the UK to move towards, or some people are already moving towards doing online consultations. Um, I don't te telehealth, some people call it, or remote consultations, or digital consultations, whatever you want to call them. Now, um, we won't touch on this massively because we got a, a, a episode tomorrow night actually. On, the whole episode on online consultations and what they might look like and what software you use and what they, you know, all those things. But, um, I did one today actually. And, um, for, for, for an NHS frontline worker and it was a really, really interesting experience. And they're clearly not the same as face-to-face -face consultations. And there's clearly, uh, when I've spoken to people about them, they've been nervous about doing them. Uh, firstly, because, you know, well, what can I actually do? What, 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 and, and, um, you know, it's a, it's a say to them, try and focus on the things rather than worry about the things you can't do. And they are going to be different interactions. Let's focus on the things that, that we can do. Now, of all the things a podiatrist does, uh, it's interesting, I think, that the exercise and rehab and strength and conditioning of all the things we do probably lends itself better to online uh, interaction than, than a lot of other, you know, a lot of the other interactions we have. Um, have you done, have you had much online uh coaching slash experience in consultation experience do you see yourself having to do more in the future and do you think that um for podiatry to work online then we're probably going to have to be doing more rehab yep definitely it's i think that's one thing that will potentially keep some clinics afloat given we don't know how long this coronavirus <laughs> shutdown everything's going to go for but yeah exercise therapies it, it's certainly one of easiest things well I, after a bit of practice it is quite easy to do via telehealth um and i find that there's not a huge difference between like aside from not having someone sitting right in front of you um when it comes to the exercise therapy component of practice that i do um yeah the online consultations don't differ too much from what actually happens in the clinic so a lot of the time, if I'm yeah assessing someone in the clinic, it's I'll demonstrate a movement, get them to perform the movement, then we discuss sort of the feedback with that, like, oh, does it hurt? Where do you feel it? Everything like that. So that translates across to telehealth very easily, as long as they've got the 
camera positioned in a way so I'd tell them to have a sort of clear space and okay I need to be able to see this this and this um, and so we'll sort of set the camera up and I might get them to move it back a little bit or that so I can get a clear view and then it's exactly the same it's okay I'll show you this movement wait till I'm sitting down to look at the camera then you show me so it just takes a little bit longer but so for some of the conditions that I'll um, do via telehealth is tendinopathy reviews. Um, so usually what will happen is I might see them initially um, face to face and then shift them to telehealth. But now with how things are, there's even some initial assessments that you can do via telehealth and Achilles is one of them. So even looking at the literature as far as the um, sensitivity and specificity of the diagnostic test for Achilles, two of the biggest um, yeah, diagnostic factors is the location of pain and the patient reported symptoms of pain. So you don't need to have someone physically sitting in front of you to discuss that. And some of the other tests, so car phrases and whatnot, you can instruct them to do that via telehealth. So yeah, you can assess and do things. So I don't, there's other practices that use it more than I do, but I've probably for about three years off and on, I have done some telehealth consults. Yeah, and it makes sense that it it leans well to that because you think about it being really, really fundamental to have a good history and to learn about their exercise history as well as their medical history and their load management and what their training volumes and dosages look like. And then, you know, like you say, giving exercises, easily done. And then it's all about advice, education, reassurance, building resilient, robust uh, humans. And, and yeah, yeah, bottom line is I think... If you're currently thinking, I'm not sure online consultations will work, how am I going to make some money if the world doesn't stop being on fire, then uh, probably time to dive into the exercise rehab literature and start start uh, boning up a bit, do you think? Oh, 100%. Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's quite, yeah, I'm actually quite a fan of the telehealth. Like, it is hard and we don't have health fund rebates for it maybe that might be a yet and same with the medicare funding so patients pay more out of well they're all out of pocket but yeah it, I, don't know, I think there is a place for it and podiatrists should be jumping a little bit on the exercise bandwagon but doing it within their sort of scope of knowledge so if you and don't have that, a big scope of and knowledge, and with, increase like we said, with, uh, with clinical reasoning too right don't just dish out three sets of ten um questions just come in <laughs> um ask talisha if she's stronger now she runs heaps i'll get i'm sure you know who that's from <laughs> that's from that was from nitta himself he's woken up and he's oh. firing in with the questions <laughs> no he's picking on me again um <laughs> definitely not <laughs> I have lost a lot of strength and that's because, yeah, I'm, I'm not strength training. Well, I've tapped, I think my max squat oh, about a year ago was about 92 kilos. I did 40 the other day and that almost killed me. So no, <laughs> running has destroyed my strength. Uh, so, Craig, how are we doing for time? Have we had any no, other we've questions? Got a, we've got a, few, got a couple of minutes, but we, we've had a, a number of questions come in. Some of them, unfortunately, will take an hour to answer. Others are a little bit off topic. Um, but there was... Uh, uh, Toby actually made an interesting comment rather than a question. Um, and I, I, I've talked Toby, about this before. Um, Lanford did. Yeah. So, interesting. Are you sure? Yeah. Sure. It, yeah it was on. a reasonably intelligent comment too. Um, ah, bullshit. Bullshit. But it was it's to do with the issue that a lot of strength and conditioning research is done on undergraduate university students, the 18 to 21 year olds and validity issues. And, and again, a lot of my research was done on 18 to 21 year olds. You know, so again I, I that's just what it is it's just an accessible population to do research on but of course it's not maybe you know as, as we just talked about over the age of 50 strength is declining so it's a very different thing but then james has actually asked a, a question which you've only got two minutes to answer but it's when when is strong enough strong enough i think that depends on the patient <laughs> so yeah. if you've ticked their goals then so if they're back to doing what they want to do, you can stop there if you like or maintain them there. If they haven't achieved what you want to achieve, then keep going. Sure, yeah. And, and, and another I, I, I think it's the same one you're about to mention. I just saw it's quite close to that, which is how, asking how you quantify strength. Or strength or yeah. how, 
how, how you measure strength. Uh, do you do it, uh, you, you know, use dynamometry? Do you do use uh, RPE? Yeah, what, what sort of, um, uh, I guess, outcome tools are you using regularly? It's, yeah, I don't use dynamometry. I think unless you're sort of dealing with a higher level athlete and you're a bit more of a physiologist and you need to hit certain numbers, then it's probably called for then. But a lot of it is RPE and I use a lot of the, um, like, the foot and ankle ability measure and the foot function index. So it's basically, yeah, not a definitive, okay, this is when you're sort of at a certain level of strength. It's just, okay, are you achieving a certain level of function? So I'd probably go more on function and strength. Cool. Anything else, Craig? No, I think that's probably a good note to finish on. We're just approaching the hour. And um, so, look, th thanks so much, everyone. Thanks for listening. We've had a lot of people watching this time, much more than we normally do. Not quite sure why, but um, it, it's... Fair enough. So, yeah. <laughs> well, no, it just could have, could have been because we've got you on and the, everyone's interested in the topic. Um, so, look, yep. thanks, everyone. I will... Thanks, Talisha. Thanks. Yep. Everyone stay safe. Uh, thanks, guys.